Over the last 20 years, research has revealed that there is a definite link between obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, and heart disease. These are all branches that grow from the same tree. What is that tree and how can we chop it down? <laughs> Plus, I know some of you are wondering what has happened to my hair. I'll take about a minute to share that at the beginning as well. Okay, first let's get to the hair and then we'll move on to more serious subjects. The answer to that, of course, is that I have made the momentous decision to stop wearing my hairpiece. Well, why did I start wearing one? When I was engaged to Benedicta, I was a little concerned about the difference in our ages and I decided that while a hairpiece was not going to make me look as young as she, at least it could modify things a bit. So I've been wearing a hairpiece since around 2008. But at this point, there is no hairpiece in the world that can disguise the fact that I'm an old guy and Ben is not an old gal. She's probably older than most of you would guess, but she's considerably younger than me. And putting on young hair on an old face doesn't really work so well, so it was just time to drop the hairpiece and reveal my semi-bald head in all its glory. Okay, now for some serious stuff. Today we're going to look at the link between four different bad guys. Diabetes, obesity, high blood pressure, and heart disease. All four of these terrible maladies have increased in our world dramatically over the last 50 years. Which is kind of strange because in America and in many parts of the world, we decided that all fat is bad, carbs are good, especially if they're whole grain. And we were sure that if we just eat high carb and a low fat diet, all our problems will be over. But of course, that has not been the case, not at all. In today's video, I'm going to be sharing from a great book written by Ivor Cummings and Jeffrey Gerber. The book is called Eat Rich, Live Long. Ivor Cummings is an interesting guy and he's become a sort of celebrity in the keto low carb movement. He is all over the internet and YouTube and he makes a lot of sense. He's a very sharp guy and he has a beautiful Irish accent that I just love. I think next to Benedicta's accent, the Irish have about the most beautiful accent in the world. Anyway, more to the point, Ivor Cummings is a brilliant man. Now, like me, he's not a doctor or a professional nutritionist. He actually has a background in biochemical engineering, but these days he calls himself <laughs> the Fat Emperor. Now, I don't know how he came to choose that title, but it can't be because he's fat. He's not fat. He looks like he's in great shape. And I don't think he's really an emperor, but I suppose it is because he's come to recognize, like many of us, that if we want optimal health, we must not fear fat, but rather embrace it. Jeffrey Gerber, who co-wrote the book, is a doctor, and in the book he shares some success stories that he's had with his patients as he steered them to a low-carb, high-fat diet. I get the idea that Ivor wrote most of this book, but I could be wrong. The book is extensive. It's fairly readable, and I'll tell you up front that I like it a lot and totally agree with its major tenets. There's no way I could give you a full summary of this book. It's just too big. But today we're going to look at a few of the things Cummins says which demonstrate the link between obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and high blood pressure. And we'll also look at the fat phobia in our world that we've lived in for over the last generation and why that fear of fat has absolutely demolished the health of millions of people. In the opening chapter, Cummins discusses the fiasco of the 1970s when the United States government decided to do us all a great favor and they strongly pushed the idea that fat was our enemy and was behind the increasing number of heart attacks that were plaguing Americans. Cummins writes these words, Since the low-fat mistake was forged into policy, Obesity rates have mushroomed and type 2 diabetes is the signature disease resulting from the fatally flawed fat theory. The number of people with type 2 diabetes has gone from less than 1% of the U.S. population in the 1960s to approximately 12% today. And I would guess that the 12% number is in fact probably too low. Some suggest that if you put diabetics and pre-diabetics together, the total would cover over half the U.S. adult population. 
At the beginning of this colossal governmental mistake in trying to fix Americans, the American Heart Association and the American Diabetes Association both walked lockstep with the low-fat phobia, and they solemnly warned Americans to cut most of the fat out of their diet and make carbohydrates the majority of all that they ate. And they weren't even very discriminating about which carbs to eat. As long as you ate carbs, whether sugar-frosted flakes, bagels, white bread, rolls, whatever, and stayed away from the fat, you would be just fine. In the 1980s, these experts decided that if they're going to promote this high-carb way of eating, it might be nice to have a little science and research behind it, since there was virtually no rigorous scientific evidence up to that point that this was even correct. It was an assumption and a gamble by the U.S. government, a gamble with our own health and lives. So studies and research were commissioned and funded to demonstrate irrefutably that a low-fat, high-carb diet was the answer to America's poor health. Hundreds of millions of dollars were spent, and Cummins reports, These trials failed spectacularly. Dietary fat does not meaningfully raise cholesterol in the majority of humans. Eventually, researchers simply gave up trying to prove that a low-fat diet had any value. But they certainly didn't give up saying it had value. It's kind of like the classic saying, my mind is made up, don't confuse me with the facts. Cummins declares, today, the American Heart Association is saying something quite different. In their massive 2015 report, Heart Disease and Stroke Statistics, it says that five hugely randomized controlled trials have demonstrated that total fat consumption does not affect rates of coronary heart disease or stroke. And in fact, they go on to declare each 5% of saturated fat in your diet that you replace with carbohydrate is associated with a 7% higher risk of coronary heart disease. Folks, that's incredible. The American Heart Association is telling us that when you replace fat with carbs in your diet, for every 5% of the fat you replace, you up your chances for heart problems by 7%. So the higher the carbs, the more likely you are to get a heart attack. The higher the fat, the less chance you have for heart problems. <laughs> Yet I get comments under my videos all the time from people who tell me, sure, you have reduced your blood sugar, but all that fat's going to give you a heart attack. Well, there's a two-word answer that applies in those cases. Says who? The research surely doesn't say this. The only ones saying this are voices from the past who made naive assumptions about fat being bad for us and of course, those people today who are foolish enough to still hang on to these unproven, invalid, unsupportable, illegitimate, unfounded theories and assumptions. The Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics has for a long time vilified fat and promoted high-carb diets, but now even they have repented. And they have said saturated fat is to be de-emphasized from nutrients of concern, given the lack of evidence connecting it with cardiovascular disease. Cummins writes, After 50 years of delusional diet dogma, we're finally seeing the return of scientific sanity. It's about time. But of course, this leaves us with the question, if fat is not the bad guy, then who is? There has to be a bad guy, right? I mean, something or some aspect of our modern lifestyles must be causing this epidemic of diabetes, high blood pressure, and heart attacks. According to Cummins and many others, it turns out that the real villain is high insulin. Now, some of you may have expected me to say high blood sugar, but in truth, high insulin probably does as much damage as high blood sugar and in fact, if you have raging high insulin levels, you will almost surely end up with high blood sugar and diabetes at some point in your life. High insulin is the forerunner. High glucose is the full manifestation. Ivor Cummins writes, Overweight and unhealthy people normally have higher insulin levels, a condition known as hyperinsulinemia. A high level of insulin in the bloodstream with associated insulin resistance is the signature dysfunction of our modern age. 
Now, what makes this particularly problematic is that this high level of insulin is tremendously destructive to health, but it may not result in high blood glucose for many years. You can go to your doctor and he'll tell you your A1C is, say, 5.9. He says, this isn't too bad. Just watch eating so much sugar. You assume you're fine when, in fact, you're in serious trouble. And to complicate matters, there is no easy, cheap home insulin test you can give yourself. Now, I can get a blood sugar meter for $20, but there's no place in Walmart or anywhere else where I can get a cheap home insulin meter. And sadly, your doctor is not likely to recommend that you take this test. So unless you go to your doctor and insist on an insulin test, you will have no idea whether you're going through every day with sky-high insulin or not. Ivor writes, Most weight problems are underpinned by excessive insulin secretion. Most heart disease is driven by diabetic vascular inflammation. High insulin and glucose levels damage the walls of your arteries, which leads to the buildup of materials in the artery walls. Therefore, most heart disease is the result of being in a state of hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance. He goes on to say, the first step in any health and weight loss strategy should be to lower insulin levels. Whatever achieves this goal will tend to resolve insulin resistance and improve weight loss. Ignoring this step is one of the primary reasons why most diets fail. And the same could be said about diabetes. Lower your insulin levels and you reduce your insulin resistance and you increase insulin sensitivity. If ever there was a way to lower our insulin levels, we should all jump on board as fast as we can. And the good news is there is a way. In fact, it's a very easy way, and yet it is so powerful. It involves switching from burning glucose for fuel to burning fat. And the major determiner for whether you burn glucose or fat for fuel to get you through your daily activities has to do with the number of carbohydrates that you eat each day. If you eat a lot of carbs, your body will turn first to the glucose they produce, and carbs always do produce glucose except for fiber carbs, and you'll be, like most people these days, a sugar burner. But our bodies are made so that we can function quite nicely without carbs or with few carbs. And how does that work? If we eat a heavy concentration of fat and few carbohydrates, our bodies will become fat-burning machines. Ivor Cummings writes, The worst thing about being a sugar burner over the long term is that it drives up your risk of acquiring the most prevalent disease in our world today, which in turn underpins the risk for most diseases of modernity, heart disease, diabetes, Alzheimer's, and many cancers. We call this disease state metabolic insulin resistance syndrome. MIRS. And the last thing you want to be on is the MIRS diet. Cummins lists five signs that indicate a likely metabolic syndrome, especially if you have three or more of them. They are these. Number one, low HDL. Two, high triglycerides, which are fats in your blood. Three, a large waist size. Four, high blood pressure. And five, high blood sugar. He states that by testing insulin levels, we could determine the presence of metabolic insulin resistance syndrome in a heartbeat. But of course, very few people ever bother with this, and most people don't even have a clue there is such a test. Cummins states that children between the ages of 6 and 19 with metabolic syndrome had almost 15 times the risk of heart disease in their future. Ivor shares a fascinating experiment with rats where researchers attempted to create metabolic syndrome in rats. They gave the rats a very high-carb, high-glucose, high-fructose diet in the form of sweetened wheat pellets. Within weeks, the rats indicated four of the five symptoms of metabolic syndrome. Their blood sugar soared, their triglycerides went through the roof, their little rat bellies grew, and their blood pressure became abnormally high. But their HDL, the good cholesterol, stayed high. The researchers, who had expected to see all five evidences of metabolic syndrome, were a little bit puzzled. Why didn't their HDL, the good cholesterol, drop? 
Then they decided to go at it again, give some more rats the same diet, but this time they ground up the wheat used for pellets very fine, essentially making white bread, highly refined and processed pellets for the rats, along with the high glucose and fructose. Within four weeks, they achieved what they were looking for. These rats evidenced all five symptoms of metabolic insulin resistance syndrome. Their blood sugar raised to diabetic levels, their blood pressure soared, their bellies grew, their triglycerides rose like crazy, and their HDL levels dropped like a stone. These rats went from healthy to terribly diseased in a month's time by eating a combination of sugar and refined processed wheat. Kind of cruel, isn't it, turning those healthy little rats into diabetics and giving them heart disease, but it sure makes a point. My friends, we are those rats. We Americans and Indians and Australians and Africans and Canadians and everybody else who daily gorges on high-carb, high-sugar diets with lots of white bread products, we are those rats. But no researchers are doing this to us. We're doing it to ourselves. But there is some good news in all of this. Once we know what's causing our problems, we learn what we need to do to fix those problems. Once you stop the parade of donuts and snack cakes and pretzels and corn chips and potatoes and rice and fruit pies and moon pies coming into your belly and all the rest of your favorite high-carb foods, and you transform from being a sugar burner to a fat burner, you are on your way to good health. And guess what? All those five symptoms will begin to reverse themselves. Your belly will shrink. Your triglycerides will fall. Your glucose levels will draw back into the normal range. Your blood pressure will decrease and your HDL should rise. You'll go from being metabolically sick and diseased to metabolically healthy. Some people foolishly say, now if I get really, really healed, and then I should be able to go back to a normal diet, right? Uh, wrong. <laughs> that so-called normal diet is what got you in trouble in the first place. Why in the world would you want to go back to it? The Bible talks about a dog returning to its own vomit, and that is exactly what you would be doing to get yourself well and then go right back to those donuts and corn chips. Okay, I think we've covered enough for now. Get the book. I highly recommend it. It's called Eat Rich, Live Long, and it's written by Ivor Cummins and Jeffrey Gerber. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up so YouTube will promote it to other diabetics who are seeking answers. And be sure and subscribe and then click the little bell icon so you'll be notified every time we post a new video. God bless. See you again soon.